kind of stepping into a role with, with our with our PAC. So, um, which obviously would only be activated if the board, you know, chose to move forward with the bond. But they have um, the last several years through the last two election cycles, they've remained active so that there wouldn't be a need to like ramp a PAC up um, if there was a need for that PAC. So, um, I don't. I think that's everybody that we have involved, right? Ms. Shapiro, those are all the involved part. You're working on technical difficulties. Working I'll keep on talking. technical. That's okay. Well, yeah. thank you for there your it patience. It just showed up. Another meeting. Yes. Oh, internet is slow. So, okay. And then, okay. I need assistance, though. Right. No, it's okay. So while she's getting set up, I, what I'll share with you is Ms. Shapiro this evening is, and you may have seen it already, but um, Ms. Shapiro is going to be sharing some of the projects that have been identified that would benefit from bond dollars, um, sharing the potential impacts on tax rate, um, some of the historical tax rate information, and then um, Ms. Burke will be walking us through, like, there's kind of two different options as to how we approach it and they have you know varying differences in, in what that bond program looks like dollars and cents wise over its life cycle so they're going to present both of those to the board as well so we can get your feedback on that three dots and then one right there yay thank you guys for your patience i appreciate it um, I have uh, three parts. Mr. Mann just talked a little bit about them. The first thing I want to be showing you is the work um, that we have done in the, it was the Fiscal Stewardship Committee, and it, uh, I guess, in the past had had a couple of different roles. So that was where the capital planning uh, kind of fell to, where we shared the facilities um uh, needs information and then also our technology needs and just overall capital planning uh, came into that committee. Um, and so uh, this is kind of the result of that. We will have one more capital committee to uh, take a look and uh, firm up this information and any feedback we may receive, uh, take that into consideration as we formalize uh, this capital plan. And Ms. Shapiro, I th this looks like it might be an older version of your form. Nope. Because so some of the labels and numbers. Were oh, it is the older it version. Earlier. I apologize. Yep. It is. We did make an adjustment. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, that was the one that. Um, so we did change one. I, I actually, though, um, I can move forward with this yep, one perfect. and just point out the area that did get updated. And that looks so tiny. Can you see it? Let me get it a little better. Um, I'm going to go here real quick and just kind of overall show that it's broken into several areas uh, for bond projects. This is specific to bond. Um, and there's a new construction section. Uh, life cycle projects come next. Again, those are things that have to happen on a on a timeline, um, you know, roofs and HVAC and plumbing and uh, fencing, things like that that just happen on a cycle. We also have our technology uh, projects are broken out here. Our bus replacement included in this bond package would be the um, solar buyout that's been presented to the board in the past and um, the safety and security project that we're working on to get the district up to a safety standard uh, in all uh, at all sites. So um, we did recognize that at the end, um, we're looking at an $85 million bond. Um, this total here is $84.1 million. Um, that left a little over, you know, uh, under $900,000, $800,000. So we moved that amount, and that is what changed from the document that was sent to the board in the attachments. We moved that amount to the Family Resource Center, and that puts that approximately 800,000 there and brings that number from 2.4 million to 3.2 million here at the Family Resource Center. So that was the major change that occurred on this spreadsheet from what I sent to the board previous to review um, to uh, the change that occurred in the new document that'll be going to the committee to review. What have been the total amounts of like the most recent bonds that we've had? 
Sure. So the most recent bond was in 2016 and it was 84 million. It was a, um, I believe it was at that time, an intent to have a 10-ish year bond. And those bond dollars, obviously, when you plan out that far, uh, the cost of things really change. <laughs> Um, it's kind of hard to anticipate, and I don't think anybody would have anticipated COVID or the level of inflation that we saw after that. Um, again, I think I've said this uh, quite a few times in this forum, the absolute epic planning that has occurred in this district um, is very impressive. We have been able to complete many projects with those bond dollars and had that bond last us for nine years. Uh, so uh, fantastic. And I know, Mr. Mann, and, and when you do that, there are certain things that, that shift. So you do the best planning you can. So we're looking at an eight-year bond plan with this bond. Um, the bigger pieces of it would be the school rebuild on that facilities planning that um, is looking to be the Biltmore campus was the next uh, campus up for a, a rebuild um, through that facilities planning process. Can I ask, um, I just, I'm not familiar with the facilities planning process. And so how does that, I guess, briefly, how that gets determined? Mm -hmm. So we bring in um, outside entities and in internal entities that evaluate our campuses based on those criteria. Um, we have some of that information that we can share with the board in a board update. I'm happy to uh, bring, I, I feel like I, I might have shared some of that information in the past, I'm not sure. Um, so that outside company goes through and it evaluates all of the uh, facilities and it kind of, the, it's got a visual. So it says these systems are green, they're really good. You're not gonna need to update them anytime soon. You have things that are aging out and maybe yellow, and then you have red, which are critical areas that could be safety concerns or their lifespan has just been so extended that they need to be refreshed, remodeled, or rebuilt. Uh, did you want to add something to that for the? Yeah, no. I, I think one of the things I think beneficial was using that outside group because it gave us another layer. I will tell you, um, and I think Miss Michaela, who's on the board now, was part of the team that did the work for the 2016 bond, and we did most of that work internally, and we. Um, actually like nailed it like we we identified things that were going to fail um, at Creighton and things that were going to fail at Kennedy like with uncanny accuracy uh, much better than what um, some other entities that we had to interact with to try to get support that we ultimately didn't get the support we needed for it <laughs> were able to determine um, but I do think it's better because in this case it was actual architects that um, reviewed sort of what the status of these facilities were and one of the things we learned over time was particularly with the with the lawsuit in the case with Glendale Elementary School District is that sometimes there's structural things that as clever as we are we can't see that that en engineering architects can actually uncover and tell mm -hmm. you you should not be in this building so mm -hmm. sorry to no, thank you no and a similar vendor I just I apologize I'm <laughs> not sure how to get out of here so I could go check and see a vendor name um, if you're yeah. looking for the architect's name, it was ADM Group. Uh, did they perform the latest facility review? That is my recollection. If it's the one that Scott had commissioned recently, yes. that would be ADM. Then Group. it was ADM. Yep. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Russell. Okay. It's escape to get to that, and then window. They're the ones it's that your stated BPA needed. To. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. That was that was happens. based on their evaluation. All these abilities. Okay. okay. Would it? <clears throat> sorry, I have laryngitis. Um, <clears throat> would it be? Um, cause at the time though, we did do partial at BPA. Correct. So that helps with the cost model because we certainly wouldn't replace the gym. Um, so that actually will be one less structure that will need to be replaced at that campus. Um, but as we learned from, you know, trying to get Kennedy underway, things cost a lot more now. So even though you're seeing, a budget that's larger than what we had budgeted for some of the other schools. Um, I think the reason that's feasible is because we do have some of those. We have we basically. I think when we built the gym, it cost us about 
wasn't just the gym it was the gym and some of the other remodels were five million in total so you know if we had just built the gym it might have been like 3.5 to 4. so that's a cost that we don't have to incur so sorry i don't mean to be stealing all your time no not uh, just mr wells did come in and say that it was adm uh is who he had brought back out again they did an excellent job on the last bond cycle um, and so uh, their information is consistent and historic, which is nice when you use that same vendor. We, um, we didn't use them on that first cycle. Oh, I thought you said you did. We did it internally on that ah, first cycle. Gotcha. So it was it was gotcha. our own team that made the determinations. We just happened to do a really good job. But then later when we had, like we predicted that there'd be issues with electrical systems and like things falling off of Kennedy. And then when they did, and because of the Glendale lawsuit being in a similar time frame, at that point we brought Architechnology in, I believe that was who it was, and they told us you need to get out of these buildings um, yeah. now. And so because of that experience, that's why we brought ADM Group in to do this round of evaluations because we recognized that we we the schools were getting to an age where we needed a deeper level of expertise than what, what we could provide internally but our facility staff um internally did work with that vendor um and uh, scott came to talk with the committee uh, to talk about that process and how involved they were and the processes that they use to make those uh, determinations. I appreciate um, just sharing all that, not just for me asking questions and also, you know, like at every meeting, a lot of times when I ask questions, it's because I want the public to know what I know. And so I think, you know, there certainly could be people that live in the Loma Linda neighborhood and are wondering why the heck they're getting the short end of the stick, it seems like, right? And so I, that's why I wanted an explanation that's also to the public to hear this decision-making process. Right. Well, and we do have dollars. Um, I, I guess for me, when I'm building out that, that bond projects and those uh, dollars, as Mr. Mann had said, things can change a lot in eight years. And the needs of today might not necessarily be the needs of three years from now. So we do, um, you know, we're very intentional. Um, I have partial rebuilds built in here for Loma Linda and Mackin. Those were the two sites that needed, uh, that got determined and identified as needing partial rebuilds. So I want to let you know that is dollars that are in there. Okay. Um, so at this time, you know, that's, that's where those dollars are intended to go. Um, without knowing the crystal ball future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the plan. And then um, some additional dollars for remodels around the district, uh, the solar buyout and um, the family resource center. The family resource center is more of a, we're changing that from remodel upgrades to a project. Uh, we think that that project could potentially be a lot bigger than the available bond dollars. So we're gonna be looking for partnerships, um, collaboration of, of intent, uh, trying to really determine the need over there so that we can um, not just stick new HVAC on it or maybe some paint. We want it to be much more extensive and address uh, that area that provides such a resource to our community. So that's why we moved those additional dollars in there to a 3.2 million, which allows us to do quite a lot. Um, and as with any of these dollars, we're always going to be looking for other avenues of potential. So I'll just point out down on our technology pro projects, uh, a couple of our projects would qualify for E-rate funding. Um, that's, can you explain what that is, please? So that's when the federal government helps with these, uh, a, a paying a portion of these technology projects um, through a competitive process, right? Jay, I believe it is competitive, isn't it? Um, I, they only get a certain amount of dollars each year to distribute out. Changes from year to year. They change the, the guideline shift. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing to know about it is um, the, it's actually a tax that's played. So when you pay your cell phone bill, um, or if you happen to still have a landline um, and you pay that bill um, or you pay your internet bill, you'll see there's like certain FCC taxes that are on there. One of those taxes goes into a pool that is then used um, for federally funded projects and E-rate is the school district portion of that. Um, and they cover a variety of things, including access and some infrastructure. Um, over the years, the amount available to schools for infrastructure have dwindled as i understand it 
and um, Mr. Denault's more an expert currently in the back of the room if, if he needs to correct me. Um, but And a lot of that has been because a lot of those dollars have been redirected to help create connections for our rural communities. There's really, that's where they're putting the focus of the dollars because that is such a such a problem in the country. So um, so there's been less available to us, but some of we have been able to get some of our like wireless upgrades and things like that covered. And the amount you get covered is based on what your free and reduced lunch calculation is. So for us, it's often been about 90% of the cost for some of But just for, for clarification of on what she was saying, it is or is not guaranteed, or is it a competitive process? It is. It is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. So if we didn't get that, it would be a $1.1 million cost out of the bond money. That exactly. Be reimbursed. Okay. Yeah, but that's we why wanted, it's in there. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I'm cutting you off. I apologize. I just wanted to point out that we're always going to be looking for other dollars. Um, to to support these projects. Um, and that's just one area that we might potentially, we still need the project done. So I need to make sure that there's dollars available there to get it done, whether we um, are able to apply for those E-rate dollars for that particular project or not. Um, but we will go for those uh, opportunities. And then um, we just plan that out over the eight years. And that's what these sales are. Um, so those, again, those are those bond projects that have been uh, put together through that process with the facilities review and, uh, just it kind of normal. I mean, it looks pretty normal to me on, on what we would typically be looking for in a bond project. Are the student iPads like literally replacing all the iPads or what? On the, dollars? the student iPads? Yeah. Yes. Just that amount. Okay. Russell, do you want to come up and speak a little bit about some of the refresh projects? I just have concerns yeah. myself about one-to-one -one iPad instruction to begin with, so I don't know that I want to be spending $5 million on it. Well, and the, I, I doubt that's one refresh cycle. It's likely multiple refresh cycles. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to explain this a little bit further. The iPad, so my goal is to understand what our refresh cycle is for every category of equipment that we have in the district and what its useful life is before we're past due for upgrading anything. And so iPads, especially uh, in students' hands, have a little bit of a limited lifespan. You know, there's loss, breakage, uh, operating systems don't get updated after a certain span of time. If I'm remembering correctly, it's on here twice because we're on a six-year cycle, maybe a five-year cycle, with student iPads, uh, and we're about three years in already. So there would be, there's two upgrades in this so do you period. cycle it once apple stops servicing that model or do you do it before then that's a part of it uh we find that aging uh, is accelerated a little bit beyond just security updates so okay. the, the need to upgrade on a little bit of a faster pace is pretty significant And then i guess then my question is there's the staff laptops and the staff ipads i'm assuming that that it doesn't all overlap, that some people have iPads and some people have laptops, but do some people have both? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so we have a matrix on how we assign out hardware to all of our staff members based off of title. Uh, so our teaching staff uh, are issued both a MacBook and a laptop, I'm sorry, and an iPad, uh, because they need to be very familiar and they're mo doing a lot of modeling with the student type devices. Uh, some st some other staff uh, do are issued both. Most are issued just a laptop. Uh, and then there's a small number of positions that are just an iPad. And that's all based off of need and, and use cases for their job duties. And sorry, this isn't a question. If anybody else has a question for Russell, mine is a general question. I just have a comment, I guess. Um, a week ago, I told someone, yeah, Lopa Lind is on the list next for new schools. So I'm out of date on um, our school rebuilds. Um, so I don't know if I just missed it, um, but I feel like we need to have a little bit more um, communication about that um, because Biltmore did just have um, quite they, a bit of- They did They did have the gym and so- um, And the whole middle school, which- Correct. I think isn't really being used anymore. So, so this, this information is relatively new. Um, and at the time that we did our last assessment, which keep in mind was our staff making that assessment, mm -hmm. um, we believed that Loma Linda was in worse condition than Biltmore. 
in the intervening time period, um, what we've what we've learned both from the architects and actually from observation, having been at the site, is that the um, because of the way the site's structured and the way the irrigation works on the site for watering, the the actual block walls are dissolving. So um, so that's you know just a function of the time frame in which those buildings were built and the nature of the site and the amount of time that has elapsed. So we've had um, I've actually been out to the campus to observe flooded classrooms because some of those some of that those block walls have become sufficiently porous that the water um, like if there's a big storm the water sometimes will seep through the block wall soak the carpets damage stuff inside the classrooms and so you know it's it's kind of a moving target um, and it's why ultimately even though we talked about specific sites when we put the ban the bond pamphlet out last time what we were guided by um, the attorney that was supporting the production of the the pamphlet was don't name schools because if things change then you'll have a problem and you won't be able to be flexible um like because as you can imagine you all have worked some of you have worked with me for many years i'm really geeky they said they needed a spreadsheet it had like i don't know six or seven hundred rows of detail in it and they're like yeah this is not what you want to do jay because then you're going to have to buy these screws for this thing no matter what the need ends up being. So they had us pare it way down to more general categories, which is why you see it. Uh, Ms. Shapiro is coming in with more background and experience than I came in in 2016 or 2015 with. So she's presenting it in more the appropriate format it would be presented in than I did back in, in 2015. Um, but at that, and that's the reason we know from the architects what the current priorities are. Um, but it, that could also change over time as well, depending on, you know, what happens with demographics over time, what happens with, um, you know, kind of the aging of the infrastructure over time. So, so do we know what a time frame would be, and and would we would those kids then be displaced, you know, at either school? Um, has that have we? Gone that, that far into it? it's a great question we have not delved that far into what the options would be it sometimes depends on the physical structure of the campus um, and then some of it will depend on demographics like we were this is going to sound weird but while declining enrollment has been a curse where it's been a blessing was when we when we had to close Creighton and when we had to close um, Kennedy we had adequate space at other campuses to move those students into. Um, that may still be the case, um, but we, we don't know for a fact that that will be the case moving forward. Thank you. Well, something you said actually goes to the question I was gonna ask, which was, um, you know, what is, what is this uh, spreadsheet going to be used for? Is it just for today's meeting or is it something that would lock us in on how we would spend bond dollars if this is like we have to file something that shows that this is what the, the intended use of the bond dollars are for before it even goes to the ballot so there is some uh locking in as mr mann referred to earlier uh the bond pamphlet itself will be set up to say which categories we plan to spend out of so it won't say a rebuild of a specific school but it would say these are new construction remodel dollars versus um, other types of dollars like uh, furniture technology and equipment. Um, there's some uh, piece in there that you have to determine how much is gonna be admin versus non-admin school site direct dollars. Uh, and so what's in the pamphlet is what you have to use those bond dollars for. It is not specific to projects, it's specific to, or like a project, like a school, but it is specific to, I can't, there's some leeway, there's a 10% leeway you can use in those lines of spending into other categories. So you'll break it into broad categories and you do have to maintain that spending. Okay, I guess my most concern was it feels like the technology and projects is like the most specific one. And so I didn't know what kind of room we had if things changed in that room. It would just be a technology line. Okay. It's it like just will say technology. Do you do you have one of the pamphlets? Um, I was say for context, when like when we did this in 2016, it was a very similar spreadsheet. It got way more detailed, like Jay said, and then it kind of got back to this. But like even things like 
the columns and when you used it like this is these are estimates of how can you break something a bigger project up over time but those things get shifted throughout the bond sales that's fine thank you <clears throat> So these are the categories. You want to pass that? So see construction, Oops. transfer equipment, people transportation. You do have people transfer transportation in this one. Okay, thank you. So if if the need change, the reason we lump it like that, like like your point on technology is a perfect point. Technology changes very rapidly. So if what we need is like AI glasses for everybody, we wouldn't be prevented from purchasing that by the pamphlet because we would just identify a certain number of dollars for technology. I don't know if I had glasses for a thing. Sorry, Russell. Any yeah, other, augmented yeah. reality. You know. yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Russell? I know I have you up here. Just okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, Ms. Shapiro, did you have any other additional information? I'm sorry. It's because we kind of got sidetracked. Sorry. We do. Hang on just a moment. I'm going to take you to um, a quick presentation. And um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of initial information before we have Ms. Burke come forward, and then she'll be sharing more details of the, the bond. So in this, I just wanted to go ahead and give some information on tax rate comparisons. As we're thinking about the bonds, we have two different packages coming forward tonight for just discussion. And um, I wanted to show the surrounding districts. Those ones that are highlighted in that orange color are the more comparable districts based on various factors. Some were more comparable because of student count. Some were more comparable because of assessed value. Uh, some are more comparable because they do have bond initiatives. You'll notice DSEG districts look a little different. So I've broken out their um, assessed value their primary tax rate, that's the one set by the legislature. Um, the last time they passed a bond, the bond year passed, their bond tax rate, their m &O override and capital override tax rates, which total the total of their secondary. Those are those um, voter initiatives that affect the tax rate and that's your secondary rate. And then the total primary and secondary. So uh, we're blue, the light blue, and we're, we're in the bucket compared to our other surrounding districts. So in some areas we're a little higher, in some areas we're a little lower. Uh, again, there are so many factors that affect that. I just thought it was good information to bring forward and shared with the board. And then I added Paradise Valley and Scottsdale just because you know they're big districts, they're unified districts, and so you can kind of see compared to elementary districts, how their tax rates kind of look. Um, they're, again, totally different than us, not really comparable. I just wanted to share information. It's interesting and good stuff to talk about, I guess. <coughs> just so anyone watching understands, when you say assessed value, you're talking about property values? Property value, the assessed uh, property values. And then um, Megan will go into more details about the two different packages we, we've uh, put together. So uh, one of them is maintaining, our current tax rate is $1.26. Um, the last, you'll see in that brochure, the last time we went out for bond, our tax rate was $1.51, and we raised the tax rate to $1.86. So we raised it $0.35 cents, um, at that time when we went out for that bond. One fiscal strategy when it comes to tax rate is to manage a tax rate so that you don't have fluctuations. So you don't have it go up and you don't have it go down. You keep it pretty flat. I found that to be pretty successful, especially when it comes to bond rating and having those discussions of how you support um, those financial decisions. I found that taxpayers tend to appreciate that more um, than having something fluctuating a lot up and down that has to be um, uh, explained uh, deeper why that that's occurring. So um, that is kind of my outlook is to maintain a flat 
tax rate and not subject our taxpayers to it going way up or way down, which is why I kind of left it in this area. So $1.26 keeps it where it is. Um, these are the information for that. Um, both of them have some pros and cons to them. One, uh, the $1.26 maintains that that lower tax rate. It keeps us in the bucket with the other districts, doesn't put us way ahead of them. Um, it supports that flat tax rate fiscal philosophy with no ups and downs. It maintains the fiscally responsible tax rate that allows us to go out for bonds in the future. Um, and then the only kind of ish downside to this is that tax rate is very affected by those shorter lifespan uh, items. So a lot of that's that technology. Um, depending upon how much money you need at each sale, it affects that tax rate. So what the dollar twenty six does is it gives me less dollars in that bucket to purchase the FT and E items. So that means that those particular projects are going to end up taking a little longer to complete under this model. Um, uh, we will get them completed. It just will take us a little longer. We'll have to kind of look at those cycles and push things out further into the bond. If we increase the tax rate to $1.36, that's a 10 cent increase. Again, much different from the 35 increase that we did at the last bond sale. Um, this allows for the quicker completion of that technology for students and staff. And uh, most of that's those refresh projects and a uh, shorter lifespan again. The other piece to this that I don't know um, comes out very often when you're looking at those spreadsheets. It's really hard when you're looking at that, which you'll see with Megan. Um, what this also does is it saves the taxpayers $3 million over the life of the bond. So a little bit of a higher tax rate means that it decreases the debt that we're responsible to pay. And it also maintains a fiscally responsible tax rate that allows for future needs. So neither one of these options are extreme. Um, they're both very doable. And uh, so I just wanted to share that information and some of the reasons why we would look at two different options. I didn't want to just bring one thing forward to the board. I wanted to give you guys some data and insight uh, so that you can have options. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan, but I need to get her PowerPoint up. Hang on one second. Vanessa, I have one question. On oh, wait, I'm so sorry. Yes, questions. Last, the tax rate comparisons. Um, we often hear that Creighton has the highest tax rate um, like within the city of Phoenix because we don't have a lot of commercial um, uh, customers or as we have more more residential as opposed to commercial um, taxpayers is is that showing here like what which part of that tells that story if that even is indeed the story is it like the primary rate or the secondary rate? I know the secondary rate is everything combined, including um, like the Phoenix Union. Uh, oh, Megan, you want to go ahead and answer? <laughs> Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Mann, um, thank you. I might be able to help okay. you with that question. It's a shifting tax burden. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so while you might necess not necessarily have the highest tax rate because you have a lower um, commercial um, uh, breakout of your property, and I have that in my presentation that Vanessa is going to pull up. It's shifting, so rather than it shifting to a larger commercial, it, it it's more burdensome or not burdensome, but there's more residential property within right. your district. Right. Okay. So that this chart doesn't necessarily reflect that. Right. Right. So thank you. Right. Russell, do you mind getting me into another screen? And I'm going to set the stage for you relative to assessed values um, and kind of the tax base, your property class um, breakout and tax rates. And then we'll talk about the two different programs that Vanessa introduced, Ms. Shapiro introduced. And then um, we'll, uh, she put some bullet points in there. I'm going to point out specifically what we're talking about. And then you um, will open it up for questions. And then did you introduce yourself? Sorry, Megan Burke with Thank Stiefel. You. Thank you. Thank you. I had intended to, but <laughs> it's okay. So our role at Stiefel is to um, 
we are the district's underwriter um, and we work with the district um, prior to the board calling for an election, whether you're doing a bond election or override election. Um, and then once the board has um, you know, moved forward and decided that they're gonna hold an election that year, we help with the voter information pamphlet process. Um, from a tax rate standpoint um, and a structuring standpoint, you have legal counsel that also drafts it. Um, they're not here this evening. Um, and then uh, after the successful election, then we are the, the group that then helps go out and sell the bonds. So that's our role. So hopefully you guys have this in front of you. I know it's a, a little bit small, but this is just a 10 year history of the district's um, assessed value. So the, um, the net limited assessed property value, the, the maroon bar, that is the base in which a, a resident um, or a taxpayer, given if it's commercial, is taxed off of. So that is your tax base. The blue bar is what's called your full cash value, and that is um, basically what your capacity calculation is for issuing debt. So, um, you know, they're both relevant, but from a tax rate standpoint, the maroon is more relevant. Um, but you'll see over time, I mean, there's just been continued increase, um, most specifically um, in the last couple of years. Uh, the last year, um, it's uh, highlighted there as an estimate. We have preliminary values that have come out in February. They will become final in August. We go through through the voter pamphlet time frame in July. Um, so the, the timing doesn't exactly align, but we will get, um, those are likely the values that would show up in your voter pamphlet for fiscal year 24, 25. So a healthy increase on your assessed value and that has an impact on your tax rate, which we'll talk about in two slides. But on the next slide, so this is to your point, um, your residential, so for your legal class breakout for your, this is for your limited property value, not your full cash value, but the, what the tax base is for um, taxpayers is, you know, your 69.3, 70% um, residential. Uh, only 28 um, makeup is commercial. You know, there's West Valley districts that are largely industrial, and so that's literally flipped. Um, and so that's the shifting tax burden that I was referring to. So your tax rate is average compared to all the other comparables. Um, there just might be more of it that is, you know, relative to a resident than commercial in your tax in your tax area. Okay, so this um, is your ten-year tax rate history. Um, the maroon is your. Um, Sorry, M and O blue, override. Yeah, the maroon is your M and O override. The blue is your bonds. Um, and when Miss Shapiro was referring to the dollar twenty six and the dollar thirty six, that is on specifically the bond only. Um, your secondary tax rate is made up of bonds, and then both your M and O override and your DAA override. So her reference to the dollar twenty six and the dollar thirty six was just comparing to this blue, um, this blue portion of the bracket that you see right here. The thing that has occurred over the course of time and building off of what was in your voter pamphlet in um, 2016, the reason you've continued to see a decline in your secondary tax rate is because when we are at this stage of the game, we are limited in what we can show in a voter pamphlet by statute. So for planning purposes, and I'll show you in, in another slide, we are limited to a growth rate that is under what you actually have been achieving. So as you achieve a higher growth rate and you've set your bonds, you've gone out, you've sold bonds, um, ultimately what happens is it, it, it produces a lower tax rate because we've assumed a lower assessed value. We've set your, you know, we've set what your bond dollar debt service is. And then as the assessed value has come in and it's higher, it, it just 
produces a lower tax rate. So that's kind of a function is what is what has happened over the last um, couple of years. Ms. Shapiro mentioned it and in 2016, you know, we went as high as $1.86 um, based on the assumptions that we used in that voter pamphlet. This is, um, there is a bond debt limit um, and so that is more off of on slide two, um, that, that would be a function of the blue bar. Um, so this is, you can issue debt that is 10% of your full cash value. So this is, um, this is a, you know, basically this is what the, the full cash value is of all the property within the district. Um, so right now today, the district could go out, if you had authorization, which you don't, um, you, you could go out and sell $42 million of bonds today. Um, based on what the AV is growing to for fiscal 24-25, you could go out and sell at that moment in time, should, the ele should you approve an, uh, an election and the election was successful, you could sell $77 million in bonds. But a bond authorization when you go out to voters is for a 10-year period. So we have to pre-plan um, for you know the next several years. The reason I put this here is because 85 million over a 10 year period. I mean, this this value, you can see it grows 30 million from year over year. If you went out 10 years, you could essentially go out for um, a bond, you know, north of 200 million. That's not what we're looking to do. Um, but I, I give this to you as context for, you know, how we plan and, and, and how it is conservative based on what your AV will grow towards. Okay. So the next couple of slides are, and I, I apologize, I know it's there's a lot of information here, but um, so it's a little small. The um, the current bond um, bonds currently outstanding uh, in the black is what the district has currently sold, and we are limited in a voter pamphlet to assume a growth rate for the first five years. Um, so you'll see over there fiscal year 25, 26 uh, through fiscal 29, 30, we are limited to show your growth rate at no more than the last 10 year average. So your last 10 year average of your assessed value is 5.06, even though you will see that this year you are going to have a growth rate of 7.57. So that that's kind of my previous comment explaining why we we're limited in what we can show in a program. And then when it comes in higher, that's why the tax rate goes a little lower. Um, then that debt that you see there is your existing previously sold debt. The district has bonds outstanding um, from the 2016 authorization. We sold bonds in 2017, 2019, 2021. And so that principal and interest associated with that debt is locked in. And that's what your tax rate will be based on this growth rate model um, should you do nothing else. Um, then moving back to your growth rate after the 5.06, which is the 10 year average, we are limited in the voter pamphlet to show only 20% of your 10 year average. So that's why it drops to the one. We, you know, this likely will be well in excess of that, but that's what we're limited to. Um, sorry, I see it. No, this is good. I just saw it flashing, so I don't know if you guys are seeing the same thing there. Sorry. So what we've done is um, schedule out based on the previous Excel spreadsheet that Vanessa had, um, based on kind of what your timing needs are for projects to be completed and assumed a sale of 20 million in 2025, 20 million in 2027, 29, and then 25 million, the balance in 3031. And targeted to achieve a tax rate level of $1.26. What her point is, and you'll see it in a minute, um, if you look at those bottom um, orange boxes, is that amount is for FT&E. So we can only amortize bonds for short-term eligible projects in the first five years of the loan. And so that first sale, um, you'll see there's you know 450,000 there, one and a half million for the next two sales, and then you know 3.5 million for that final sale. Total debt service associated with um, the this bond package for 85 million, you'll see is the 135. 135 million. Do you see that in column 12? Okay. Okay, Ms. Shapiro, can you then move to slides forward? 
this is the dollar thirty-six. So what you'll see now is rather than four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that first sale in twenty twenty-five for short-term eligible projects, it jumps to one and a half million. Um, it jumps in the next two sales from the one and a half million to two point one million and one point eight million, and then that fi and final sale, you know, it's like five point um, five point three million. That was the point she was trying to make is that we're able to um, move short term eligible projects to be repaid and um, used or paid for quicker. Um, and then the total debt service asso associated with this model, we still did 20 million, 20 million, 20 million, 25 million. But with the increased tax rate, you'll see total debt service now of 136 million as opposed, sorry, 100 and. We looked at this. Um, I don't. I don't know that it's right here. I think it's on the breakout in this that we had in our spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah. It's about three million. It is three, three million, million less. The so we did money. move some of these numbers around, yeah. and we'll um, redo these sheets for final versions as we get closer. But as you pay off debt faster, um, then it obviously reduces your interest costs. So. Um, I think something is we need to fix there, but yeah. So just for my clarification, mm -hmm. if I understand what you're saying correctly, it's a higher tax rate, but ultimately the taxpayers are spending less money on the bond. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And um, if you go back to, um, so one more page forward. So here you'll see then the average home value in the district is 252,000. That's the average. Um, obviously there's a lot of property that's well in excess of that, but the the cost for that scenario one on an annual basis is $181. $181. Um, whereas if you go two more slides forward, um, you know, that's 184. So um, it that's just kind of the difference between the 10 cent tax increase is $3. Um, so I don't know if there's discussion. Um, I, I don't know that we necessarily need to make a decision about the tax rate implication here. I'm mostly available for questions, and I think then you guys can talk internally about um, how you would you know, like to proceed forward. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns from board members? I know everybody's thinking right now. It's a lot of pro information to process. Yeah. So, and it's it's our intention to, you know, based on board feedback, to come back with a recommendation to the board at the April board meeting. Um, April's a little unusual because of the NSBA conference. We only have the one meeting, um, but we feel like pushing into May would probably be too late to bring it as an item. So, um, so that April meeting is likely the sweet spot for us to kind of come back and mm -hmm. and ask the board if they have so, desire to yeah. move forward. And yeah, and if you have a time. Yeah, here's the time schedule. So this is the county deadlines um, for moving forward with an election. Um, so the board does need to um, submit uh, a recommendation to which you plan to move forward. In July, you have to submit your um, pamphlet to um, the elections department. So, you know, it, Again, you could wait till May, but then also, you know, it's causing your pack delay and there's lots of other implications. So at a minimum, though, you want to do something by June. But that's, I think, why the staff has made a recommendation to have me present this initially and then come back in April with formal, formal, formal board approval. So you're not necessarily looking for um, feedback on the the different tax rates you're just saying well maybe you are but you're just saying this is kind of where we want to keep it within is these two yeah i mean it, theoretically i mean the district could go out for a hundred million dollar bond and you could raise your tax rate you know 30 cents but in working with staff there's obviously um sensitivity around an increase in a tax rate um we could go out for an election and have a decrease in a tax rate but likely what you would need to do in that situation is um, a lower bond amount or, you know, the short term eligible projects would have to be delayed. Um, and there's implications with that because of, you know, your device requirements and, and, and the need to do that. So we're trying to balance all of the different, you know, um, variables and 
you know, we've put in front of you, um, you know, a, a maintenance of and a 10%, or sorry, a 10 cent, if there was board discussion and, and there was other options that were, you know, wanted to be um, reviewed or looked at, we'd be happy to, you know, share those. And, and I think our leaning at this time, so it would be good, like if anyone has an opinion on this, is that while, you know, we're, we're always avoiding increasing tax rate where we can, it feels like that 10 cent increase is fairly modest and ultimately saves our taxpayers $3 million over the life of the, of the bond, plus gives us greater flexibility to be able to um, affect projects where they need to happen. Because while we schedule all these projects out, as we've watched over the last nine years, sometimes something crops up that causes us to have to change a timeline on something. So having that greater flexibility is really beneficial. It, it gives um, the team more flexibility to react to problems. And sometimes they're not even problems, sometimes they're blessings like the um, electric bus grant. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate to have, some districts couldn't take advantage of it because they didn't have bus bond dollars and the grant doesn't pay for all of it. So being able to have some of those dollars available for things like that earlier in the bond sale versus later might create opportunities that would be available to us. So that's probably not the best example, but it's just something that's come up recently. So it's kind of a, a very recent example of where that flexibility becomes very powerful. So in layman's terms, mm -hmm. How would you explain to someone, yes, we're increasing it by 10 cents mm -hmm. or whatever, um, but saving how much? Three? Three million. Three million? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's based on a 5% interest rate assumption and, right. and the actual growth rate that we're restricted to in a voter pamphlet. But in, you know, in the materials that will be, you know, produced for the uh, election, we would help, you know, help with drafting any language that would try to describe that to a layman taxpayer okay so, but but it's just so i understand yeah <laughs> with my head um it's basically we're paying the debt off Back sooner to, right. so right. okay yep. yeah and just think about if you have 30-year mortgage and you end up paying <clears throat> off in 20 years your the interest cost associated with that re you know faster or rapid payment right. of your debt you'd save you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest it's the same concept here at Thank you. Um, there's also an added advantage because if you're able to tackle the projects faster, the taxpayers see the, results. the progress versus seeing it nine years from now. Yeah. Any other? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's just, it, it all is about Any other questions, concerns? Um, is 10 cents usually the norm? Um, the only reason why I'm sitting here and thinking is that we don't really know with all these vouchers and what the future looks like with funding for public schools. I'm not sure where that lays. So I think we have an added advantage, maybe given the community that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, is 10 cents usually what usually is in? I know you said that it's moderate. Has it ever been a little bit more? Has it been? It, it really is. Uh, given the history of our district, I haven't yeah. been here through the history of all the bonds that we've done, but has there been any specific times that we've gone for higher amounts? Yes. So what what I can't show you, um, but I have it in front of me, um, is the voter pamphlet from 2016. And at the time, because the district, so in 2016, the district did a bond election. And the last election that they did prior to that bond election was in 2009, and it was only for $44 million. So 2009 and 2016. Correct. How often can you run bonds? Um, you, if you ran a bond election this year, you could run the bond election next year. What is, and I, I don't want to get too in the weeds about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It but, just... um, you, if you do a bond election and it's a hundred million dollars, you have 10 years right. to sell all hundred million dollars, but there's nothing that prevents you from selling that in four years. So in year five, you could go out and do another bond election. Got it. But what happened was you had done a 2009 bond election. It was 44 million. Your tax base was much lower, um, and you know you did a couple of a couple sales in the 20 million dollar range. At the time, prior to doing the 2016 bond election, your tax rate was a dollar 51 for bonds. Doing an 85 million dollar bond election, which was a double the ask 
we showed in the voter pamphlet a tax rate of $1.86. So that was a 30 cent, 35 cent tax jump on bonds just on that program alone. In 2016. In 2016. You could do 85 million with no tax impact. You could do 85 million with a 10 cent tax impact. You could do it with the 20 cent tax impact. That would just mean we would amortize your bonds even quicker than what you saw in scenario two and the debt associated or the interest costs associated with scenario two would be even less. Um, it's dependent on every, some districts do a $500 million bond election and they show no tax impact. Some do it and they have a 50 cent, 50 cent tax impact. So it's really what you know about your community, um, your community is supportive. You've had, you know, your tax pass or sorry, your election passage rate um, for the last bonds or the last election was 55.6%. Um, so, you know, you're not, you know, 49.51 type of situation. So it's, it's really what the, the cabinet and board um, is most comfortable, you know, presenting. Okay. And, and I'll share, we kind of guided okay. um, Ms. Burke to be somewhat conservative just because we were concerned about some of the comments like Ms. McSheffrey shared that you know, there, there is a sense in our community sometimes the tax rate's high, but I don't think that's a function specifically of Creighton because keep in mind in our district, we have Creighton for tax rate, we have Phoenix Union for tax rate. Um, those two things show as schools. We also have uh, Maricopa County Community Colleges. Uh, that district has recently um, passed some bonds in recent years. Um, and then there's, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of other elements. But what families seem to notice, at least the ones that I've spoken with, is that the largest chunk of their secondary tax rate that they're paying really is for the two school districts, for um, for Creighton and for Phoenix Union. Mm -hmm. And so that that has been where we've had some communication from the community in the past about concerns around, around tax rate. Okay. I don't have any, oh, go ahead. And just, just for um, reminder sake, uh, the overrides, expire not for a while, right? Yeah, so we, you know, we've, and, and I'd be happy to um, provide Ms. Shapiro with the chart that I, I may have even given it to her, the chart I used to use to track all the elections. But um, what we've been doing is we found that the even years, the gubernatorial and presidential years are the most successful for us. So we've tried to schedule things to where we're not going out more than every other year. So our hand isn't always out, number one. Um, so we're hitting that success, successful election cycle, but then the, the other reasoning for it was to not try to not go out for two or three things at once. So if we were to go out for this bond in 24, it would really be the right timing to go out for both overrides, the m and and the capital again in 26. So that would be the first time where we'd be in a position where we kind of need to run them together. And that has to do with you know, the down cycling of M and O, if we don't, if we, if we don't pass it by 27, it starts to down cycle. And then the, and then the capital sunsets at a certain point. So to be able to, to make sure both of those are maintained over time, we would actually need to float, either float both of those elections in 26 or go out in back to back years where we might try an odd year. Um, but, you know, based on the data that we have, it looks like those even years are our more successful time frame. Sorry for taking that one. I'll let you take it in the future. I just had the history, so. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and there just, is on, sorry, there is on slide four. Um, there is a history of bond and override um, elections. These are successful. These aren't the ones that were unsuccessful. Um, in the, under the tax rate table, sorry, we didn't go into detail on this. I know we were trying to keep this to a yeah, minimum. Yeah. Um, but one thing to point out is MNO, it says the last year, that's the last year MNO does ratchet down. Um, so they're good for seven years, full for five, ratchets down in six and seven by one third in each year if it's not renewed. So the year that you did see here, see would be if it just phased out and 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 you didn't go out for new. But the DAA was last done um, in 2020. So that to Jay's point, we would want to go out. That's a full for seven years by 2026. Yeah. Mr. Mann, I apologize. You can, I, I'm not very formal. Okay. Any other questions, concerns, comments? All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. 
So, Madam President, members of the board, with apologies to Ms. Shapiro, having noticed the time that it is at 722 in our full board meeting, out. were you going to shoot, were you going to pass me a note? I missed out on that. No, I was going to say what you're about to say. Okay, sorry. Do you want to say it? <laughs> no, go right I keep ahead. Steal, I keep stealing <laughs> your thunder today. Um, it, it, we might want to table the budget conversation for a future board meeting. We, yeah. do have, we do have more time and space with that than we do with the bond. We just knew that was coming up in April. Um, and if you're okay with that, so with apologies to you, both for suggesting it and for stealing your suggestion of it. And I just, I, I would, <laughs> I would be grateful for uh, time to spend uh, discussion, discussing the budget, the budget process. There's some uh, changes in the, in the requirements of reporting. I think they're fantastic changes uh, and they allow us to uh, present the and develop the budget in um, a way that I would have been doing anyways. Uh, so it's great to get that information out there and be very transparent with the process. But I do want to have time to discuss it, explain it, and, and add value as to why that transparency is really um, important for a school district. And I also want to make sure that I get information from the board members on the types of things that you would like to see as we're developing the budget and the um, types of information that, that maybe need to stand out for you that I can go into detail. You know, the areas that I goober over might not necessarily be the areas that you guys uh, enjoy as much. Um, I, I really jazz on uh, how the budget's broken up with the account coding. I've talked about account coding before. I think it's fantastic to have a set of numbers that tell you everything. It is amazing. So um, the budget is absolutely aligned with that account coding process. So maybe I can make account code joy in everyone. So... <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm. If I have no objection from the other board members, I'm okay if we table the budget discussion to another time, just to give us more clarity and give you guys more time to do that as well. Um, do I hear any objections? No. Since it's a study session, Hilda, Ms. Hardis. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and adjourn our study session. I'm going to go on a quick two-minute recess, and then we'll be right back with our regular board meeting. Thank you. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> how much value do you have in the top half of our district? And how that bottom half can average it out to 200. That is wild. Even though there's four and six million dollar homes at the one end. I yeah. know. I mean, we're talking people that live on 32nd Street in Stanford. Yep. yep. Oh, what I was saying is they presented to the board. I'm going to stack this because I know she likes to look at these.
Yes? Okay. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. We're going to go ahead and reconvene the meeting, and we're going to go ahead and start with our land acknowledgement. The Creighton School District understands that our community of schools is located on the ancestral land of the Otham Jude and Akima Otham people who descended from the Hohokam and have inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The Otham, whose name translates literally to people, are a vibrant culture and community spanning countless generations into the past, continuing to thrive in the present, and carrying a powerful legacy for generations into the future. With this acknowledgement, the Creighton School District formally recognizes that the traditional care and keeping of these lands by indigenous people is an aspirational model of community stewardship that we are committed to honor with practices, policy, and human relations. And with that, we will have um, Dr. Lauren start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And that brings us to roll call. We are all here Ms. Gibson McLean, Ms. Ayers, myself. Ms. McCaleb and Ms. McSheffrey, thank you. We want to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting and remind the audience of the request to address board cards that are on the left side. Um, that must be completed and submitted to the board secretary if they wish to speak to an agenda item. Board policy provides for two cards, white cards to be submitted in order to speak to an agenda item and blue cards to be submitted in order to speak during public comments. Due to open meeting law, board members are not allowed to address items that are not on the agenda. And that's per, that's per our reference policy, BEDH. That brings us to approval of agenda. I move the governing board, approve the agenda as presented. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. Awesome. And that brings us to our governing board reports. And Ms. Gibson is writing. So Ms. McSheffrey, I'm going to turn it over here first. I do not have one today. Awesome. Thank you. Ms. McCaleb? I'm going to save my voice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I danced in the rain too much this weekend. and The wedding went well. Now I have no voice. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Ayers? My voice is bad too. I was at the wedding, but I didn't dance in the rain. I didn't scream a lot. It's just been like this for a long time. I don't know when it's going to come back. So I have nothing. Miss Gibson McLean. Um, well, congratulations to Lindsay and happy birthday to Sophia. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, we had a, we just had another, I guess, I hope everybody had a good spring break um, and people got some relaxation in. We had a committee meeting. Was it last week? It was last Not week. Not this week. Okay. Yeah. It was last week. Um, and we're chugging right along. I'm honestly, I will say surprised, but I don't want to jinx us or anything. <laughs> um, so we've gotten through. Um, Wow, dress code. And then we've uh, tackled a couple of other big things. And so please join us next week. I believe it is next week on Thursday, if I remember. This is correctly. all just a quiz for you, Jay. Yeah, I know. Like, you're just, it's like, are you super? I could just look at not? my calendar right no, now, but good. I'm not. Um, next week, uh, again, we'll be here. And so obviously it's March. So we're really getting into the. Um, to the uh, grind here to try to get uh, all of these, because it seems like every time we think of something, we're like, well, this is a related. So hopefully we are not coming to you and asking for an extension. I hope that we can get through everything by the end of uh, the year and, and the date that we've, the dates we've prescribed. So again, if you would like to please uh, come to our meetings in person or watch them online, you can provide public comment. Um, as well. So thank you to everyone on the committee for their hard work and continued hard work. Thank you for that. Um, just a board update that I have is that I know that we have some really cool events going on this week that I'm really excited for. I know that we have our art expo, I believe it is tomorrow. Um, yes, 
So at five o'clock, so if you guys can go ahead and make the art expo at Monte Vista to showcase our, the beautiful art. I know we have some beautiful ones over here. And on the left side, this is amazing work from our students around the district. So that's always awesome. Um, I know that a lot of the schools are having their own kindergarten um, fairs. So that's cool. Um, Excelencia has one coming up tomorrow. And I know Thursday, BPA has one. Um, so that's really awesome. And I also know that in the month of April, we have um, the Family Resource Center is actually putting on together a baby shower for the community. I don't know if that and you guys knew that our Family Resource puts those together. So we um, pregnant persons can come in, sign up, and they get free diapers. We throw food, baby shower. We do games. We do the whole nine yards. And it's remarkable what the ladies do. We're also going to have a kindergarten um, fair. I like to say we because I live at the Family Resource Center, basically. So I take a lot of pride and ownership in what they do. So there's also going to be a kindergarten fair going on in the district wide at the Family Resource Center there. And it's really cool because um, they have different countries that they're representing. And it was awesome to see all the parents. Um, we did a tour of the Family Resource Center for First Things First, which is who the Family Resource Center is grant funded by. And um, Governor Hobbs, um, it's a part of Governor Hobbs' administration, and they were really excited with the stuff that we're doing in the Family Resource Center. There's, I believe, 88 Family Resource Centers in the whole state of Arizona, and our Family Resource Center is one of the few, if not only, that has certain um, anemones like giving out diapers for free or the DCS grants that they just got to help community members get their water paid, their gas. So if you guys know anybody in the community that's needing assistance, our Family Resource Center has direct dollars for that. So it's really amazing to see all the work that our specific Family Resource um, is doing. And that's why I was so happy to see some itemized um, numbers on there for them for the bond because they really hold the epitome of this district. You know, our parents go there, our zero to five children go there, all the services that they have. Um, so it's it really holds the district together. So um, if you guys can check that out, that would be awesome as well. And that's the only update that I have for myself. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Mr. J. I know it's late. I know it's your birthday. And so I'm going to keep it very, very short. Um, I'll start with some some sad news. Um, a longtime teacher in our district, um, Luann Verhelst, um, we recently found out had passed away. Um, and for those of you who knew Luann, she was just an amazing bright light of energy, but also um, she was our music teacher at Papago for many years. And I just remember enjoying so many performances uh, that she was fine. I think she brought students to perform here in the boardroom a couple of times and, and at a, a variety of other events. So Ms. Verhulst was my music teacher in the nineties. Oh, wow. There you go. It's, it's a small world and there's always connections, right? So um, very, very sad for that news. And of course, condolences go out to her family. Um, to kind of build off of the committee work that our policy committee is working on. Um, we also have our, our student conduct and behavior support team that's looking for proactive supports for our students. And they have actually reached the point where they have their rubric for how they're going to measure possible programmatic elements we could bring in to support um, our, our teachers, our staff, and especially our, our kids throughout the district for next year. And they have actually started their tours. I think their their first <coughs> tour of a school district to look at the program they're using was actually this morning. So, um, so they're out there trying to get that work done so that we were able to look at um, bringing some programmatic elements and uh, bring a recommendation forward and then bring programmatic elements in for next year. So I'm just going to go with those two for time, but um, thank you for the opportunity to share those things. And one thing I forgot to mention is that I know that we had our first spaces. What's our special education? Did we have that oh, last oh week? Oh my goodness, meeting? that was my other one. It was our CFAC. C I yeah, can't sorry. believe I, can't I keep... forgot that. Um, yeah. I got to be there. It was awesome. It was so awesome that they were struggling. Nobody wanted to leave. Um, I, my, 
my test the next morning got canceled, but I was supposed to be fasting for a test. So I ducked out earlier than I wanted to. I wanted to be there to the bitter end with everybody, but I realized I wouldn't get to to have my last meal before before my test. So um, so I didn't get, I have no idea you guys could have stayed till midnight for all I know. I know we were like beyond 30 minutes past our time and people were still hanging out. And I think one of the big things that we learned was that we need to build in time for the families to connect because they really loved connecting with each other as well. But my thanks to the whole special education team, mm -hmm. everyone involved in in pulling that together. I know it's been in planning for a while. Um, and those families, so we had, if my count is right, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had like eight or nine distinct families that showed up, but we had more individual because there was two parents from some of those families. Um, and that actually for us historically is a lot, but we'd like it to be more. But one of the things that we charge them with is to bring others and they left energized to bring others. So I know, you know, it's, it's going to continue to grow and it's going to be an amazing feedback loop for us as we continue to dig in and, and improve our programs throughout the district. So again, thanks to the team for, for that effort. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you too. I know that I wasn't there. I had to take a last minute trip that week, but I am really thankful for you guys um, supporting us. I know it's been a talk amongst the community. And one of the things that we really strive to is listening to the community. And I know that this is something that we've been um, I, not neglecting, but it's it hasn't been operating the way it should. And I know that this is the starting point. I know we only have a few families, but that's the way that it starts, right? But what I'm most grateful for is that the initiative was done to actually hearing the community and bringing these families together to actually advocate for their students. So that's awesome. And it's very aligned with the SOFG framework that we're also doing. So I appreciated that. And I wanted to make sure that that was, that was brought up. Thank you for catching it. I'm just going to throw one more quick story because it's so awesome. I'm going to embarrass um miss green in the background there and dr dupe in here but one of our parents who was there with their two children one who currently um is in our program and one that is one of our future attendees um in our district um he i had been introduced to him outside of mac in school like I think last year, because we ran into him, I was with Dr. Dupin and Dr. Dupin was his principal when he was a student at that school and Miss Green was his teacher. So it, what's amazing and super cool is we do have like multi-generational families within our district mm -hmm. and seeing them not only bring their kids back here, but participate in opportunities to give us input and feedback is really so for me it was super exciting to have a former student who was i know we have a for, we have former student board member but to have a former <laughs> student who um who you know who actually was then part of our conversation mm -hmm. about what we're doing for students now so i, I just wanted to share that just really quick because it's coming to mind and i would hate for her to just be barely mentioned but you know i think miss v i we used to call her miss v started in the district at a time when we didn't have a lot of money for music and art education and i recall her only being able to come so many times a month or a week or like maybe like once a month because i'm sure she went mm -hmm. to all the sites and uh i feel like she always did like the most she could with what she had which was interesting i'm sure um now looking back but she had a choir for us at Monta Vista. we also had a recorder choir which i'm sure our parents all enjoyed <laughs> um and and we even she was even on the cusp of technology because we created we did a fundraiser where we all sang songs on a cassette tapes that she then mass produced and we sold for a fundraiser which i'm also sure sounded fantastic <laughs> um which included like barbie girl and things like that so it was great it was a great time she was a great teacher from what i recall so i'm sorry for uh, her loved one's loss <laughs> Thank you for that. And thank you guys for all the work you're doing in the district. Um, Mr. Man, I didn't mean to cut you off. Was that it? No, it wasn't. I'm, okay. sorry. I'm sorry to have stretched no, 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 I just thought okay. it was, it, it, the story had touched me with watching it unfold. So, Okay, perfect. So that brings us to our student outcomes focused governance update, was this, which is the SOFG framework. And for the past few weeks, I think we actually completed our site councils now. I wasn't there to make it to the last few weeks, but we've been going around. We started it off with community council getting feedback on the new goals that the district is doing. I think with all the feedback, and I'm hoping everybody had an opportunity to look at it, we can discuss the five goals if we need to make any edits. And if not, then I think we're ready to move forward to adopting them. Um, I've gone through the feedback, I've talked to people in the meetings, in person, 
And it seems like our goals are very aligned with what the community is saying. Um, you guys can see it in the paperwork. I don't know if you guys have any edits to any of the board goals. I'm not talking about guard guardrails right now, but from what I personally have been hearing and seeing, a lot of them seem to be very aligned of not making major um, changes. The only concerns that I am hearing is um, that our goals are very eighth grade based and a lot of the families were stating, well, what about the third grade and the second grade and fifth grade? Um, I think part of this framework um, and, and having this interactions with our community is part of like educate, education on our part and their part too, where we're going to have interim goals within those goals. So that's going to be up to once our goals are adopted to our superintendent and our administrators to come back and tell us, well, this is what we're going to do in the meantime to get to that overall five-year goal. And it can be focusing on third grade literacy. It can be focusing on what we're doing in fifth grade. I'm not sure what that looks like, but once we get to that point, we'll get to discuss um, what we if we accept those interim goals or not. So I guess the question here now is, after reading the feedback, do you guys have any major concerns about changing the goals that we have? Do we have any edits? What are you guys feeling, thinking? The one edit that I saw in here um, about changing like the teachers to staff, um, it was under the guardrails. We're talking about board goals um, right now, and then sorry, yeah, okay. no, it's okay. Um, I think the board goals. Maybe if we can pull that up and have it up here too, because I know that administrator had some adjustments on some um, of the board goals. So um, I think the only <clears throat> the biggest thing that stood out. Well, one going back to yes, I, we had feedback on the eighth grade, but I think that goes back to those interim goals and also realizing that five years from now, the eighth graders are the third graders now. <laughs> so, um, but the one that I heard like the most discussion about was um, the looking at the eighth grade EL students and measuring, using the Azella to measure simply because if you're newcomer students, if, you know, there's something else going on that you have not been evaluated throughout the time, like, are we going to get to that? And that was brought up by several um, folks. <clears throat> and I don't have the perfect answer for what those edits are. I'm trying to recall the numbers. Do we remember, like, what the... Because I remember a lot of times I was having those feelings, and then when we talked about actual numbers of students and what that looks like to move the, the meter, then I would feel better. So I don't recall the actual numbers of students. Well, and, and I, I don't mean to put Dr. Dupin or Dr. Pombo on the spot, but I know that the Azela scores and the EL students were one of the things that there were some potential recommendations for a possible shift. So I don't know if if you have that. You are. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that, that, and that information might help with that concern that you've heard, because I think they structured it a different way yeah, to make it, it a little, it. yeah, a little clearer, more understandable and ensure that it's attainable. So. And then I also wanted to make sure we, we discussed or thought about the concerns over calling out, um, eighth grade black students, um, on the math just because um, some students had some issues with that. And there is a privacy issue in, in because the number of kids are so small. Um, and if we want to, I don't, want, I don't want to unintentionally be adding any shame to these kids um, and bring up possibilities for bullying of these particular students. Um, in my experience, that wasn't something that really was brought up in the community forums, especially with talking with parents. I know I wasn't there when kids cognates ha um, happened, and I know that was one concern, but it hasn't some it hasn't been something that I've personally heard at the different sites with administrators, teachers, support staff, parents. I that's just not something that is going around. I understand that it could be a concern to um, 
separate, you know, different people and how they, the lens that they see it in. But I don't, I personally don't believe that this would cause any added on bullying or any added on any of other that, especially because I haven't heard it around. I don't know if anybody else has a different experience, but that's not something that has been a, a prominent concern going around doing the tours. It just came from students. Yeah. That's, and that's and it was Well, I guess I just want to clarify. It was one student, right? No, it was actually, it was the last way I remember it being communicated at the last meeting. Yeah, we, we shared the story from one student, okay. but that's um, it, I, I, if I remember correctly, Dr. Dupin, you were there. I think it was about three students who had raised concern during the course of the meeting. Yes. Am I remembering correctly? That's correct. Yeah. I guess I'll just clarify on the privacy issue, right? Like, again, I'll say that we're not violating any privacy because these scores are published. And so if there's just an inherent privacy issue because of the number of people, we're not revealing any information that isn't already publicly available is what I'm trying to, that's my whole thing, right? So I understand we're highlighting something. At the same time, it's all information that's on the ADD website as it is. Right. I know so, kids aren't going to go hang out on the AD website. I also know most people aren't. My other thing, though, is that um, I also don't know how many kids are going to hang out and look at our board goals and talk about them if they're not in Kids Congress. All those things to say, they're valid. I mean, if there are their concerns, they are valid concerns. And I have a lot of follow up questions and curiosities about all of that before I just go ahead and strike that as one of the goals. And, and I think a lot of conversations can go around with this if we decide to adopt this on maybe a strategize and have a, meet, a conversation with Mr. Mann on how we will present this, especially when we're talking to students. Um, but also, I don't necessarily feel that it's something that we should completely strike out because um, it's not something that I commonly have heard going around. Well, there's another Kids Congress in April. I mean, I'd love to have a follow up with them myself after, you know, us discussing it a couple times. Um, I think it's something that would be valuable for you guys to hear. And, and there's probably other opportunities to hear from them if that's not a convenient time. But I think, you know, I'd like to think that our kids are not bullying each other about silly things like this. But um, I also want to be living in reality and not give them an opportunity to use that, um, especially for black kids. I mean, this came from someone who possibly identified and, and again, we don't know, that was something that was brought up um, just recently at Biltmore. There's not a way, you know, people identify <coughs> differently on, <coughs> and there's not a way to identify as multiracial and black. You have to pick one, I guess. You can't separate that out. So it's just complicated and I don't want to, I don't want to unintentionally contribute to something that is shaming kids or, you know, putting putting them in an uncomfortable situation any further than they may already feel like they are. Right. And I think that's why after the adoption of the goals, there's going to be a lot of communication back and forth, not only with the students, but the community and the parents. Um, because I also think in our leadership roles and making sure that our students are attaining and receiving the best resources they can, our data historically assuring that our Black students historically, year after year after year, have met none of the criteria. So in my, I, I understand, but in my in my um, governance mode is it's imperative that we give the resources and the attention to the most vulnerable and from the data that we've pulled from 2016, it keeps showing up that our black students are the ones that are being impacted most by the lack of whatever we're doing. So I think that's why it's important to um, have goals like this because then all our resources and our time and our efforts are going to go to who is being mostly impacted and clearly um, one of those most impacted is black students given the zero percent of them going on to high school without knowledge on math. So um, I, I think that's why uh, um, if we decide to adopt this goal after tonight, it's a very crucial that we do have a conversation with admin and our superintendent and maybe even our um, principals to make sure that we're relaying the information where it's not intended to be 
in a hurtful matter versus a this is what we're gonna do because this is the group that's most impacted and we're gonna give all our resources so you guys can be up to everybody else. And then I think also using the right language, like not even impacted, like as adults, and I'm not talking, I'm not targeting anyone here, teachers, whatever, I'm talking about every single adult in this issue, including us, like we've said in this, is responsible for all of this. And so nothing at all should be placed on the students as far as, <laughs> like ownership of this at all and so as adults we definitely need to have these types of goals because until people are not acting like they're colorblind until people are are actually making sure that that all students are being served equally these numbers are not going to improve and, and i think that's an important point i think if we move forward with this as a goal it's important that we frame it not as these students have failed but that we failed these students so yes. um, so at a minimum that that framing needs to be in place so that way we're not putting the blame on the students but um, i do agree I, one of the things i always am concerned about and we've had this happen a number of times one of the dangers when you're involving a lot of people in conversations about things is you don't want them to give their feedback and then feel like their concerns were not were Certainly. not heard. So I, I want to make certain, and I think Ms. McSheffrey's suggestion that we that we go back to that student group, I think is is an important one. Um, as we've tried to be more collaborative in the district, one of one of the unintentional harms that's been created at times is that sometimes you know people feel like, well, we gave you our feedback, but you didn't do what we asked you to do. Well, sometimes you know we take the feedback, we implement what we can from within that feedback, but there's multiple feedback, there's multiple factors. So um, I think it's important for us to make sure we're we're having those conversations as well. I just checked my calendar and I am free on April 19th at 11 a.m. So I'm going to do my best to make it to that Kids Congress. And then I know um, this has already been brought up, but I I was hoping that we would have um, the recommendations of Dr. Pombo and Dr. Dupin um, side by side with our board goals, just so we can see, you know, because I think there was some quite a bit of thought put into that, you know, just so we can kind of see what their recommendations were as well when we do get to a final was that the adoption. Last meeting or the board meeting before that? I think it was the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe, I believe it was the last board meeting. Yeah, that's what I was, <coughs> I was hoping them. to see because yeah. I know there were some language tweets. Yeah, it was at the end of the present the data presentation that we went through. <coughs> it was March 5th. Okay, so it wasn't the last one. It was it was two board meetings. So this yeah. It was the last board meeting because it's still March. It feels like it's April already. <laughs> it feels like this meeting yeah, stretched it'd into April. It'd be nice to see them just side by side and have I don't know if give some thought that. for that. Yeah. Are we able to do that or no? Is that have them side by side like um, the recommendations we had from March fifth and our goals? Right now. Yeah. Um, Is that possible? I don't know where. I can make a slideshow really quick and put them. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 it's okay. We've got so, it. We, they're here. They're just of, not side It was by part side. of the PowerPoint, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it was yeah. part of the PowerPoint. That's, that's the problem, because it wasn't by themselves. It was part of their PowerPoint. It was, it was on the last slide, I believe. Okay, can we, can, can you guys just send it to us so we can look yeah. at it between now and the next board meeting? We're not voting on anything tonight. Yeah, we, we can absolutely, um, and actually, rather than just sending it to you in its current format, I don't think it would be a hardship to put the two sets side by side yeah, and yeah. send them out right. to you. So, yeah. yeah. And we don't have to wait for a board update. We can just go ahead okay. and push that Okay, that'd be out. great. That's all, yeah. In fact, we'll probably it's have... It's going to take more than like 15 minutes right, <laughs> right, to think right. about it, you know. And, and in addition to that, and I haven't had a chance to share this, um, our extended exec team, which includes Dr. Pombo, um, um, Gretchen, uh, who's our new, um, uh, and I'm sorry to address you by first name, it is late and my brain is not working, but our um, Exceptional Student Services Director um, and, and several members of the team, including Tyson, <coughs> who you worked with on the original goals, um, are going to be working with uh, Dr. Ramos on April 2nd to try to get some more information and start moving forward on some of those interims and some of those pieces. So we'll have some information from that that we'll need to share out with you anyway. So as we share that out, um, we'll also we'll share this out as well. So that way you hopefully we'll be able to get you a lot of different pieces of information 
um, after next week. It's, it's going to be actually a week from today that we'll be doing that. It'll probably take us a day or two after that to pull pull things together and get them off to you. Um, and then just for next board meeting, we will be taking action on those board goals. So I just want to make sure that everybody's reading their materials, reading everything, coming forward with your questions or setting up those one-on-ones if you have questions before, because um, where our community feedback is done, we have the we have all the paperwork, the community feedback. Um, Dr. Pombo brought up those recommendations last meeting. So for the next board meeting, so we're all aware we're gonna be voting and having a discussion. So just make sure that once those materials are sent out to you, we're actually reading them, going through and not using this time to look for paperwork or ask questions um, just so we can get those goals settled. And I'm assuming the next meeting is gonna be after that Kids Congress meeting. So that will play it's not, out. It's not. It's not? It, it'll, it'll be. It, it, yeah, unfortunately, it's the Tuesday prior to the Friday. Of the oh, okay. Morning, so, uh, okay. Um, I don't think it's a matter of not reading it. It's that we had a lot, and then we had these possible adjustments <clears throat> at the end of our discussion last time. But it's being able to then look at those next to the ones we have and figure out, are we meshing them? So I think that's what we expected yeah. to be able to see tonight. Yeah, and I, I apologize for not having it. Yeah, right. and it's, it, is, it will be important for me to circle back with the kids. I'll just be honest with you, so. Yeah, and no, that's fine. Nobody said it, yeah. We won't be able to do it before the vote, it sounds like, so. Yeah, well, we, if, do we want to circle back with the kids and make sure we're, because it's the same kids Congress, right? So that's the only thing is that if it's only three kids and it's the same amount of kids, how are you getting more information that it's an actual issue within the students? That's what I'm trying to get at. If we go back to kids Congress, What's your solution off of that? If it's only the same individuals, it's a bit, it's about having a conversation with them and saying, "Look, this is these are the discussions that we've had with the board. You know, does it does it make you feel any differently?" Or are those three students? Are they students at three different schools? Um, they I are, believe it was the ones at least were, two. Two of them were from one school, and then one was from another school. Is it possible to coordinate a conversation with them before kids Congress? Um, please I, could I'd be willing to participate in that conversation if it's possible to coordinate it if that's what we're trying to do is have that conversation again prior to the next prior to the vote if that's not feasible well if if, if I um, <sighs> if I'm following the conversation correctly I don't know that there's new information that we'll get from those kids but i think it's a matter of of addressing their concerns so and i and if i'm misspeaking Ms. mcsheffrey please correct me but it, it feels like you know if if that's the volume of that feedback and the board feels comfortable taking action that tuesday prior to that friday meeting that conversation could still take place at kids congress and it would really just be explaining here here's here's what we've here's the Here's the goals we brought you originally. Here's what we've adopted. They may be identical. They may be slightly different, depending on how you feel about some of the recommended changes. Um, and then, and then have a conversation with them about we heard your concerns and we value them. And here's why we still chose to move forward in this way. And here's what we're going to do as we communicate the goals out to try to address the concerns. So I don't, I don't know if that would. I help. mean, I feel like it's. We're leaving out the other kids in Kids Congress to just because yeah. they're the other ones were all there sitting there and listening to the conversation. Yeah. So I hate to exclude them. Um, I was just trying to come up with a solution that would please people, but if that's all right, this is fine with me. I'm just a solution person, so I was trying to think of something on the fly, but it's fine. I'll go to Kids Congress too. I'll be at the meeting. I'm eager to hear it. Thank you. They're fun. Okay. Um, I I personally believe that's the action step that I would like to take what Mr. Mann recommended, but I am only one voice, so it's up to the rest of the board what you want to do. But at this point, I believe that for the next meeting, we should go over the board goals and look over all the information and, and start making a decision on adopting our goals. Um, that's just where I'm at it at this moment. Any other comments? 
Okay. Uh, moving over to the guardrails, I really do think that we need to get our board goals straight first, and then the guardrail conversation can come up so we can move that over to the next um, agenda item, especially because I need to follow up with Dr. Rommel's on, on the guardrails as well. Um, one of the ones for sure that we're not going to do is the board self-evaluation, and I'm going to make sure that all the other ones don't intersect with stuff within the framework. I'm really hoping um, we're taking the responsibility also of reading the book, um, just because I know that there's a lot of questions or sometimes stuff comes up, and if we're reading the literature of this um, framework, it, it really depicts and goes into detail on why certain things are written a certain way or why certain goals or guardrails are executed in such a, a, a certain way. So that's part of our job to make sure that we're reading and, and, and understanding the material. And if we're not, this is the perfect opportunity to ask questions or set up one-on-ones to make sure that we're getting clarity on either the guardrails or the, uh, or the goals. But I think guardrails and goals, mixing them together when we're adopting them can get a little bit confusing. So I'm going to if everybody is okay, we're gonna table the guardrail conversation until we can kind of get our goals um, in place and set up. Um, a couple of comments. Um, I, yeah. would, I would like to, if we could make a note to add staff, just so that we don't lose that note, because I think that was a good um, To To which as, one, I'm as, sorry? To the guardrail. For the right board here. guardrails. Oh, board, sorry. So we, we're missing the word staff in there, really. Okay. That's all. Easy yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, why was the this one removed? The board will not operate without a self annual self-evaluation. So within the framework, um, the self-evaluation, um, we end up getting a sheet and it tells us the self-evaluation is within the framework already that has to be done once a year already. So if we added it as a guardrail, it's already expected of us to do a board self-evaluation every year. So it can't, it's like double doing we're wasting a guardrail basically on something that we're already going to be doing yearly anyways. Okay. So, so that's why nice we're taking thing it. To have out there publicly because I did get some comments about that, you know, like who's going to hold you accountable for doing that. And it's like, because we haven't done one for a couple of years. So it was nice to ha just have it public. That's all. Yeah. Um, but I think about that's the anti-racist training because there was comments about that too. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was still on the other one. What about the anti-racist training? How come that was removed? Um, I don't. Oh, see it it, I think it was. I think it was accidental because it was. Oh yeah. Part, it was part of the self evaluation. Yeah. So we. I think. I don't think that, that was intended started. to be removed. It's not in the frame. Yeah, it's not in the framework. Um, but our goals are very anti racist. Can I ask a question? Um, it's my understanding that we will adopt eventually an entire framework. Yes. And in that adoption, we could amend the evaluation section to include that portion if we need. Yes, we can add it too. Okay. And I thought it was going to be added to the superintendent's guardrail as one of the indicators. That the board will not go out without self-evaluation every year? Or that the anti-racist thing was going to be added as an indicator somewhere. And that could be an indicator to us, like an interim guardrail. That's why the guardrail conversation, I kind of was like, let me set it off to the next agenda because there is a lot of, but okay. yeah, the anti-racist yeah. can be, yeah, under the superintendent guardrail as well. I just got good feedback, that's all. Yeah. I heard. And I don't think it was meant to be taken out. It was just the self-evaluation portion of it, but we can include it within the self-evaluation. In the framework. Mm -hmm. In the framework that it exists already. Um. Do we have any other questions or comments regarding the guardrails? Okay. Um, Mr. Mann, did you have anything to add on to the SOFG framework? No, I, I, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the fact, you know, that we we've, we've gathered so much input and feedback and I and I do appreciate the concerns about making sure we honor the, the concerns of the students as well so I think we can address all of that um, and and as I said we'll be getting the side-by-side -side out to you along with anything else we get from Dr. Ramos on on the second we'll get that out to you the end of that week so that we have it sooner rather than later instead of having to wait for a board update and hopefully that'll uh, put us in a good position to be ready to have the the work that we need to do in April, so. Awesome. 
All right, I'm gonna move on to the next agenda item, which is public comments. We do have one public comments and I invite Claudia Garcia. Um, some conversation, huh? I was happy. Oh, I didn't expect that. Uh, so I just wanted to speak about the recent uh, personal lawsuit against the board and just kind of reassure the board that uh, trying to connect with other parents to organize our support for our current board. And, um, you know, I really think that there's a place here, got to look hard to take the high road on this. Um, but 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 I think that if I had to speak to any parent and explain why why we should um, support our uh, dual language aversion program at Biltmore, it's because we do believe that it is delivering. It is delivering according to the state standards. I have two children who have gone through the program. They are both. Uh, above average <laughs> academically, they are just fine. Um, and, you know, it's brought to my attention that there's a point about uh, Engl English learners being in the program, that, that that's really the problem. And I say, so what? Okay, so what? So there's a couple of English learners in the program. Guess what? My biggest surprise at Biltmore was not all the Spanish speaking kids that joined the program. It was all the uh, excited and earnest uh, non-English, uh, 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 non-Spanish speaking families that were there to put uh, their children in this dual language immersion program. And just the goodness that that brought to my kid's life you know, I'm, I'm out of district. My kids could have gone to Hopi or they could have gone to Great Hearts, but they would not have had the multicultural experience that they had at Biltmore. And I think it's difficult to explain to someone outside of this situation all the advantages that that offers, but it's been huge. I mean, they will take that with them forever. And I want them to be people who go into the world, who understand, what it's like to be sensitive to others who understand a sense of the world and our dual language immersion experience has given them that and it is because of the school district like i said we came out of district to come here and it's just been a priceless experience so you know there's there's so many layers to this lawsuit um, that there just has to be a way to find the high road. I think looking at it technically, legally, um, would be, you know, to explain to the parents, you know, where the board is going, you know, get some feedback um, can only help. You know, I know the eight people that I heard back from today, no one said, oh, that's great, the board's being sued. Like, no, nobody said that. No one said, that's amazing. No, everyone said, oh, this is, the, this is awful, he's a bad man. Um, so, uh, just so you know, I know eight people who got back to me. They each know eight people who know eight people. And uh, just want to reassure you that we are trying to uh, do what we can to uh, organize. We just need a little bit of guidance. And I think we could certainly make a political impact if with, with that. Um, and, 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 you know, and I want to hit this point, too, because it's important about what you were talking about there. The sen there's this balance between sensitivity, transparency execution and that's what government's about right that's why we have government because government is a public trust we trust our public officials to make good decisions for them i don't have it all the time in the world to uh, figure out what standard my kids should be learning to i trust my government the market cannot solve everything. That's why there are environmental protections. That's why there's public education, because we need a government. It's not supposed to be for profit. And so that's the message I would give to my fellow parents at Biltmore. And I want to reassure you that we're going to do what we can. Um, a little, little bit of feedback would go a long way. Um, but but we're, we, you have, you have, you're going to have a quorum. You're going to have some people behind you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your words. Thank you. 
All right, and that brings us to our next agenda item, which is um, approval of consent. I move the governing board approve consent agenda items A through D in accordance with policy BEDB-E. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that brings us to our next agenda item, which is acceptance of financial audit reports for fiscal year 22 and 23. It's the Miss Shapiro show tonight, so I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Yeah. Uh, Madam President, board members, and Mr. Mann, uh, we have tonight uh, Mr. Joshua Jumper, who is a CPA and a certified governmental uh, finance manager with our external audit firm, Heinfeld & Meech. I believe I will be able to do the technology with no assistance. <laughs> Oh, but somebody needs to exit out of this first. <laughs> Thank you for your patience also. No problem. One thing we've learned over the years is auditors have a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> they will outweigh you if they have to. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Oh. So if you just let me know when you're ready, I will. I'm start. ready. Go All ahead. Right. To the next slide. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board, Mr. Meehan. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to present the audit results for the district's annual audit for the year ended June 30th, 2023. So we're looking backwards. Uh, and I have some slides here, but I'm going to keep my comments fairly brief uh, and not dive into anything too specific, but again, happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so just uh, to start with what is the annual audit uh, for the district and what does that look like and what reports get issued. Uh, so we're the external auditors and we're procured through competitive proposals. So we go through the, uh, the district's normal procurement policy uh, to be uh, selected as the external auditors. And the year under audit I'm speaking to is the fifth year of the audit on contract. Uh, so just wanted to lay out the timeline for the annual audit. Uh, so way back last May, the engagement letter, which uh, gives approval to begin the audit uh, process, was done. In June, we made an on-site visit for some preliminary audit procedures. We came back in October to do more uh, audit procedures in line with the issuing of the AFR. Uh, and then in December, uh, the financial statements were issued, uh, not on the slide, but then in January and February, the other reports were issued, which I'll touch on in just a minute. So uh, the audit reports that are issued. So uh, the first one's communication to governance. So this is a letter that's included in uh, your documents, uh, which I'll touch on in a minute. The annual comprehensive financial report. So the ACFR, this is the district's financial statements. The single audit reporting package. So this report is submitted to the federal government and reports the district's uh, spending of federal grants and any findings related to, to those. And then the U, Uniform System of Financial Re Records Compliance Questionnaire, the USFR. So that is required by the state. And so we assist in reviewing that and submitting that to the state. Uh, so the scope of audit services, uh, provide an audit in accordance with US generally ex accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards, uniform guidance. I'll roll off some other long words uh, and then complete the USFR compliance questionnaire. Okay, so just getting into what's our responsibility as the external auditors and then what's the responsibility of management when it comes to the audit. Uh, so we uh, do fraud communications, inquiries to various members uh, at the district um, to just uh, ensure we're uh, looking for that and being aware of anything that may have arisen. But ultimately, the responsibility for fraud at your entity 
lies with management and the board. So just distinguishing between that, uh, the, the audit isn't necessarily geared to, to catch fraud 100% of the time. And ultimately the responsibility lies with management and the board. Which goes into, we provide reasonable, not absolute assurance. Sound a little like a lawyer in that statement, but it, we're, uh, it's true. All right, go to the next one. Uh, so summary of audit adjustments. Uh, and so if we came across any uncorrected misstatements in the financial statements, we I would be required to communicate that with you here and also in the letter in your packet. Uh, please to report there were no uncorrected misstatements uh, for the year ended, June 30th, 2023. And then just touching on some non-audit services that are done in conjunction with the annual audit. So we assist with the preparation of the ACFR in terms of getting the data from the district and compiling that report. And then um, the schedule of expenditure of federal awards and the data collection form, which both go to the federal government. Some other required communications. Uh, Please report we had no disagreements with management uh, during the audit process. Uh, they signed the representation letter at the end. And then, okay, go ahead into the next slide. I'll just touch on some of the reports. So I'm not gonna get into the reports and specific items or numbers in any of the reports, but please report that the financial statements had a unmodified opinion and uh, non-accountant speak, that's a clean opinion. So please to report that the financial statements were free from material misstatement. And then this is more just for your reference. If you wish to look through the, the act for, uh, those are the pages on specific areas. <coughs> Single audit reporting package. Again, this is the report that goes to the federal government. Please report there were no findings noted in that report, looking at the federal grants for the year, we looked at the ESSER grant and the Title I grant, reported no findings. I know, that's a big <laughs> Yes, yeah, so great news. And then, oh yes, the big USFR compliance questionnaire. So we spend a great deal of energy on this report that goes to the state because it covers a bunch of different areas of the district that we look at. So these are just a few procedures of management and board, uh, accounting records, cash and revenues, procurement, student attendance, travel processes and procedures, credit card, purchasing cards, you name it, we probably look at it in some form or fashion. And so in total, this uh, questionnaire has uh, about 170 questions that we have to answer or no. And so I'm pleased to report, uh, in this report that went to the state, there was only nine no answers uh, and just minor items noted. Uh, so Ms. Shapiro wanted me to touch on perspective co in comparison to other districts. And so uh, we also other, we audit other school districts in the state. Um, and I would, without getting into specifics, but definitely the, the number of no's or the number of items we, were required to note to the state was on the low end in comparison with all districts as a whole. And so yes, the audit process went well uh, and happy to answer any questions you might have. Do we have any questions or comments? I know that it's a long report and I appreciate everything that's done. And I also appreciate that out of all the things that we do and out of all the questions that are asked that we're actually in compliance, we didn't have any issues with ESSER funds or Title I, which I know that that's always a big um, thing. So it, it just speaks volumes of the district. So I am appreciative of that. And, and I would like to point out with that um, USFR compliance questionnaire, uh, it does change. The questions change year to year uh, when the Auditor General's office rolls that out. Um, it has different focuses. Uh, I would be concerned if we, this is going to sound 
weird, but I would be concerned if we had no findings in the USFR compliance questionnaire. We know that the uh, district runs a very large process. I mean, just even to process payroll, to take student attendance, um, is it, it involves a lot of people and the risk to human error is very high in some of those processes. Uh, so, you know, zero is really hard to maintain. <laughs> so I'd probably say go look again. Um, <laughs> so, And those things are not to say that that's not important or something to strive for, but that does give us a measure of processes. So the compliance questionnaire makes sure that our processes are flowing the way that we expect them to do. Um, when we're talking about fraud, fraud involves uh, developing internal controls. So our auditors are good partners in that, but it's our responsibility to develop those processes that are likely to reduce the chances of fraud. Um, and we work closely with our auditors to make sure that our internal controls are good. Uh, it's not necessarily digging through everything every single piece of paper and seeing if there's something right or wrong. So I'm just, I'm super impressed with Creighton. Once again, um, to me, uh, anything on the compliance questionnaire under 15 is amazing. Um, so 15, I think is like, oh, that's fantastic. It's a celebration. So to have nine, to have less than 10, especially with uh, student attendance, that seems to be the most common one that most districts have. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, and and as Josh said, it's, it's a yes or a no. So when you're reporting attendance and you put it in there and you say, well, 959, that's a half day absence, which we're required to report for some reason, it doesn't affect funding. Uh, they just make us report it uh, for some reason. Um, but, uh, and you and you should have been 958 was the one that cut it off and it was one minute and, and you reported a half instead of a full or vice versa. The question is, did you report it properly? And it's yes or no, they don't, I, I'm sure they care, uh, but one minute, it, it happens, it happens. So nine is excellent, very impressed, very impressed with Creighton. And just uh, the ch change in the law a couple of years ago, one of the things that's required with this, so we've always had, I mean, as long as I've been here, um, Heinfeld and Meech has been kind enough to come and report. Um, it's now required that the board take action by roll call vote to accept the audit. So I just okay. want to make sure we don't, it's late and we're all tired, and I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss that um, in the process this evening. Okay. Do we have any other questions, comments, or concerns regarding the audit before I go into the motion? I guess, yes. did, did you guys work with a board member on this this year as is tradition or is that not, I don't know. Yes, we always uh, have at least a phone call discussion with a board member. And <laughs> of course, now you asked, I can't remember which one of you I spoke to, but I, I know. Everyone's here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, we speak to a board member each year and, uh, <laughs> And it's I'm just sitting. it's typically random and usually due to availability and who's available when we're on site. So just curious. Say, yes. Thank you. you called me and I missed your call more than likely. I will say thank you for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you for doing this work. And um, thank you for the added entertainment of your facial expressions this evening. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> you don't have a poker face. <laughs> no other. Oh, go ahead. Um, Sorry. This is super nitpicky, but um, for all of, like for a lot of these, it's no yes, but also NA and the drop downs. But on the one on 23 about completing high school requirements <laughs> and we don't have a high school, why is that no and not NA? That's a good question. I, I believe in the because form really that we, <laughs> so the form gets submitted to the auditor general and it's an online form that we, we basically go in and put yes, no, and a comment if applicable. And I believe in that one, it was just due to their form having an error, oh. or we couldn't put an A. So that gets us down to eight. That, that's why I brought it up. It was nitpicky, yeah. but you know, no, super competitive. Question. Yeah, sometimes there's not a perfect match between the Is questions. The and the Auditor General or the Arizona Auditor General? Arizona Auditor General. Oh, yeah. We'll easily give them feedback on that. It's like, forget about it if we got to contact someone at the federal level. Once again, a form coming to us usually late in the day and not formatted properly. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I don't believe we have any more questions, comments, or discussion on this. So thank you so much for the presentation. I appreciate it. And I move the governing board accept the audit reports for fiscal year 22-23 in compliance with ARS 15-914.H. Second. All those in favor? Um, and I have to do it by rock call. Sorry. I remembered. <laughs> Ms. Katie Gibson-McLean? Aye. Ms. Ayers? Aye. Myself, I, Ms. McCaleb, I, Ms. McSheffrey, I. Awesome, thank you so much. You. And that brings us to our next um, discussion item, which will be um, I invite Ms. Earl, which is the principal of Papago School, and the Equity Committee, and you guys will be providing an update on information gathered regarding the renaming of Papago School. So welcome. Thank you so much for being so patient with us. Sorry for keeping you out so late yeah. on the school night. School's canceled tomorrow, right? <laughs> that's Friday. Hey, hey, right? hey, that's Friday. I, I think the board will give you a holiday Friday. <laughs> thank you, it's thank Friday. You. Cesar Chavez. Wow, the county that we <clears throat> today off. I didn't even know. And I added her PowerPoint to the folder. Okay, thank you. It's not up to me, right? No, I'm trying. <laughs> you just have to think harder, Vanessa. You'll get it there. It's currently in use. Try one more time. Well, the computer's deciding if it wants to connect. It's not letting me connect. It's right at her. Your present is it in meetings, Hilda? Uh, yeah, it should be under mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you um if documents, it'll say PowerPoint. If you go to featured, go under documents. I see that. Thank you. And it's in. You're talking about the presentation. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Is it there it is. There it is. Yay! I think the computer's tired too. Yeah, everything's moving slowly tonight. I'll try to speak slowly too. <laughs> I happen to speak. Quick. Um, if you want, while that's loading, or do you want me to read the letter? Or do you want to read the letter? I think we can read the letter for right now. Sure, please. Oh, <clears throat> sure. Dear Crane School Board, um, I trust this letter finds you well. We are writing to formally request permission to proceed with the selection of the new Papago Elementary School. Our existing committee composed of diverse stakeholders has thoroughly, and there it goes, considered the matter and has determined that a name change is essential to better align with their school's core values. The committee is eager to embark on the process of choosing a name that reflects the inclusive and forward-thinking nature of our school community. We understand and are committed to adhering the requirements set by the governing board for a school name change. We kindly seek your approval to move forward with this important initiative and assure you of our commitment to a transparent and collaborative process. Thank you for your time and consideration. And it, there's a whole bunch of names attached to who are part of the Papago Equity Committee. Excellent. Thank you so much for reading that. Good evening, um, board members, for president and executive team. Um, today, the Panther Equity team is honored to present our formal request to change the school name. Um, tonight, we'll review our progress today in three stages which we have listed here, um, examination, exploration, and advocacy. I'd like to introduce um, the equity team members. They're all listed on the screen, but three are present here with us tonight. One is Isaiah Washington. He is our child justice advocate and equity team facilitator. He will be uh, uh, presenting with me tonight. And also Ms. Tarina Dixon, our preschool teacher, and Ms. Senna Tamazuka, who is a kindergarten teacher. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also, Ms. Um, Dixon has been a longest member of this committee. So this is our either a third or fourth year. Mr. Washington joined us last year, and Ms. Uh, Tomazuka joined this year. So just a little background about that. Thank you for everything you guys do. So this uh, team wanted to make sure we talked about all the different phases and make sure that you kind of could see the broad picture of what we've been doing and the process that we took. And it's, it's in steps over three years. So um, we worked through the phases and we wanted to request the name change tonight. And so the first year and the first step of it was to, um, was examination. So we really wanted to just be introduced to the issue, which we were informed about it. And then we started kind of researching and we started presenting about what we knew that was like this deep. 
And then we found out, ooh, that people had a lot of questions and I only shared this much information. So we went a lot deeper. And so in the second, second year, we were able to um, go a little deeper. And we realized the last time I presented here, we realized we still hadn't shared with our younger students. And so this year, year three, we added lower grade students to be included in that process. So we've had um, parents, we've had community, we've had um, multiple staff and also Native American Family Nights uh, over the past three years. Um, and moving into the exploration where we were um, digging deeper into identity development and also um, our, developing our name suggestions. That's the second um, phase and it's taken a couple of years to just kind of get a few suggestions and then kind of refine the process. So that's what that's about. And then Mr. Washington will show a little bit more. And so tonight we're here after all of this work to be able to say, we really do think it's time we're ready to uh, formally propose a request to make a name change. So Mr. Washington. Okay, I skipped the slide, hold on. <laughs> um, but the other thing we wanted to make sure we, um, <laughs> sorry, I was watching it, that we wanted to make sure you knew about is that we really do think that um, this decision will not only reflect our district's dedication to equity, equity or just our schools, but it will really serve as a catalyst for this broader community to kind of reconsider the use of the word Papago. So there's still a freeway, there's a golf course, there's a park, there's a lot still named after Papago. And so if ours changes, I think the, the effects it may have are deep. So we wanted to make sure we, we recognize that this is an important step for us. So now, welcome Mr. Washington. Thank you. Uh, good evening, folks. Um, Madam President, governing board members, Mr. Mann. Um, so part of our role as part of the equity team um, on that year two, so the first year that I came in, uh, was really looking at listening to the examination that um, Mrs. Earl had shared with us at staff meetings, giving us more information uh, about the name, kind of the history behind it, and looking towards that. Um, we were able to also work as an equity team to receive a range of perspectives and input uh, as she shared through our staff in those staff PDs. We met about um, coming up with some ideas and some cons considerations. Uh, we also had uh, some community members share their input, whether that, that was through Google Forms and Google uh, surveys, um, as well as some considerations with students. Uh, we will also had an opportunity to talk with our Native American families and get some of their considerations and their suggestions with this. Um, and moving forward, we have also, throughout this whole process, let me state, uh, we were always being mindful of the governing board policy, as well as making sure that we were having our community here, as well as our Native American representation with any decisions or considerations that we had. Uh, this year, I've been super excited to work with our equity team, uh, having it be a lot larger, having some new voices, as well as some folks that have already been doing some of this work. Uh, we focus a lot of our work on reviewing our purpose with the school name change, as well as giving some more information for, you know, maybe some of the students that hadn't really heard about why we were considering this, or even just, as we know, if any of us have been in the classroom, we have to uh, review with our students. They got to remember what's been going on. Uh, so we made sure to create some presentations and share that with some of our lower grade students, as well as sharing a Google survey and getting their voice, getting their input and uh, getting some suggestions. Many of them, I guess, had a idea that maybe we wouldn't be Panthers anymore. So they always wanted to put Panthers in there. We also had some creative things. I think some of us, some of them wanted Hogwarts and <laughs> that nature. Um, but, uh, after getting, <laughs> yeah, after getting some of that data, we, as a, a site equity team, looked over the data of the suggestions that we got from our students, as well as those suggestions from the community and staff. Uh, and we were able to look at at least uh, top three that you'll see that are listed there. Uh, and we were able to look at these suggestions and we looked at the governing board policy as a team and really tried to look at do these suggestions meet the criteria for that governing board policy? And does that align with our Native American representation and with our community? Um, so based on the criteria of the governing board policy and with some of the uh, Native American representation, some of the top name suggestions you see here are agave. Um, so that came up in one of our staff meetings, looking at the agave plant holds significant cultural and symbolic value in uh, Native American culture 
whether that was with medicine or with food and things of that nature. Um, and one note here could be a fitting uh, representation for resilience and sustenance. That's what we always want with our students and with our staff. Uh, another one that came up was Piestoa. Uh, now, namely, that goes with Piestoa Peak, which uh, geographically is the peak that we see from our second story windows as we look out. So, you know, it really makes sense with our, with our, uh, our area, plus, got to love the P there, can still go with Panthers, so all those kids worried about Panthers, it could connect. Um, but also, uh, looking at, it's named after an Army soldier, Lori Piestua, a member of the Hopi tribe, who was the first Native American woman to die in combat while serving in the U.S. military. So again, recognizing that Native American representation. Um, another one that came up was Desert. Now, we weren't sure what we would have with Desert, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were incorporating desert because it does acknowledge the Papago tribe who are now known uh, and I now identify as the Tahana Autumn Nation, um, which, which translates to desert people. Mm -hmm. So those are the three uh, suggestions we have come up with as a committee. Um, and thank you for your time. We're open to some questions and suggestions from our committee team. Thank you so much for the presentation. I am full heartedly Thankful for you guys taking all this time, spending it in the community. I'll open it up to my board members, but for myself, I really don't have any feedback other than you guys are doing an amazing job and whatever you bring forth, I can, I'm more than trustworthy that it is representation of the community that you guys are leading. So I'm, I'm okay with whatever you guys decide as a community and bring forth, I, I, I'll deflect to you guys, but I love the names. I love the three and I love the where the vision is going. And I think you guys are doing an amazing job. So thank you for taking the time. And, you know, like you said, this could lead into something more of a ripple effect in the city. So that's, that's great. So thank you. Um, any comments, Ms. McSheffrey? Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I've been wondering why it's taken so long, but I really appreciate the fact that you took your time. I know you got some pushback in the beginning. Do you feel like, um, you came to a consensus? Do you feel like everyone came together in the end? Or there, is there going to be still some people sad to lose the name that's been around for a long time? I think we'll still see a few, but yeah. overall, I think they've, they've it's because it's been going on a long time, some of them are also wondering why hasn't it happened yet? Mm -hmm. So I think, but because we've been talking about it a long time, at least it won't be a shock to mm -hmm. most people. And mm -hmm. so for that reason, I think it shouldn't be Push, there shouldn't be too much pushback. And we have a lot of efforts that we've made to communicate with parents. Mm -hmm. So what's your next step? How how do you think you're going to decide the from the three? Well, that's what we wanted. That's why we came to okay. you because we wanted to make sure we were following the policy and also making sure that um, if we had any additional steps that you'd like us to take before we move forward, that's why we came tonight and wanted to. Well, I'll put my two cents in. I I like all three of these, so you know whatever happens happens. But I love the idea of um, naming it after Lori Piestoa and the fact that you can see Piestoa Peak from the second floor is really cool. Mm -hmm. That's I think been a hard name for the valley to get you know get used to. It's a hard name to pronounce, but I think you guys would be leaders in you know adding that that name to another. Um, another entity. So that's just happens to be my favorite, but good luck <laughs> picking the, picking the top one. Thank you, Ms. McSheffrey. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate all the work y'all have done. It's really great to see the, the effort and the energy that's put, put into this. I appreciate the suggestions. I think I'd be really interested in knowing if there's any way to have any conversations with any Tohana Autumn leaders, because, um, you know, and I'm not saying this in any way, but, you know, Native American folks are not a monolith and tribes are not a monolith. And I, I while I appreciate mm -hmm. Lori Paestua um, and thought that that would maybe be a, been a more fitting name for my middle school alma mater than what it has right now. That's another thing. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that maybe given what the reasoning behind the name change in general to like switch to the namesake of someone who's Hopi, I would prefer to see us celebrate the Ta'an Adam tribe in, in some way rather than to just settle for something that's Native American. And so whether that be a leader from their tribe or words 
that you've and I like the the direction of the desert people. Um, so so I, I would love to see if there's any way to explore that a little bit more to honor their tribe rather than to than to just go away from it altogether. Um, and just to give a little bit of context, because I know this conversation was started during the pandemic and you weren't on the board, we actually had the vice chair, I believe he was at that time of the Tohono Hotham Nation. Um, and we actually met or step, not me personally, but admin. And I know, I don't know if you had the pleasure of meeting him um, Cyril, but there was a conversation um, going back and forth and they kind of got the green light of whatever this process has gotten into, but we did vet it with, we made sure that we were intentional in making sure that somebody from the Tahoma Nation was helping us. And when we first started the process, that's how it was. And then they kind of, it felt kind of like a blessing, like, okay, you guys got our input. Now this is, you guys can do whatever you want and whatever works for your community. So I'm not saying that that's not something to look into, but I just wanted to make sure for community clarity, because it has been a couple of years, that was how we started the process was um, side by side with the vice chair or the chair at that time. Certainly, and I actually, I believe I watched one of those meetings and then was here in a, the audience for another one where you presented. And so I guess what I'm more looking for is a converse of specific conversation yeah, about that. potential names, not necessarily history or blessings or things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, any other comments, concerns, questions? Um, trying to save my voice, but I agree with a lot of what was said and um, just all the work you guys have been, have put in. Um, I, I like all three names. Um, the only thing is, does Agave fit in our policy? Because it's not a geographic location or area. Well, it depends on how, you know, there's no policy police and it depends on, I, yeah, just... on how you interpret <laughs> policy. But having a geeky son whose um, specialization is sustainable horticulture, <laughs> um, the agave terraces are sort of a geographic location and are very like they're kind of a important component of that culture through throughout you know not just our state but all the way down into Mexico and if you were to go to Mission Garden in Tucson um, one of the things you would see that they're working to recreate there is, is the agave terraces. They have agave festival every year that uh, members of the Tejano um, Nation participate in. So, um, so I think it it while the word agave itself refers to a plant, it does also have a regional connotation in the sense of you know the places where those agaves grow. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but. And being the lawyer type of lawyer who wants to just find a way to do it rather than saying you can't do it, this has no statutes on the policy. Right. We can just amend this policy and add whatever the heck we want to it before we do the name change. Yeah, or <laughs> or even I'm just being yeah. transparent. Yeah, or even suspend the policy. <laughs> or suspend the policy. Yeah. Like, whatever. I mean, if you, nobody yeah. wants to set the precedent, fine. But how often are we getting name change for this? Yeah. Come on. Now. So it, it feels like maybe a final double check through maybe some sort of community survey might be in order. Um, we can push it out through our Miss um, uh, Wazolik, who I know is online watching this in case we made more work for her, um, could, uh, could go ahead and push it out through our community newsletter. And we could kind of gather some feedback on sort of the three finalist names. And then um, with the other concerns addressed, I don't know if you still have a con contact or if um, if President uh, Carrillo might be able to get us a contact where we could also maybe do a check in with um, with the tribal elder who helped us out, you know, first go around and say, here's, that. Yeah, yeah, that was here's cool. where we planned. Yeah. So if we could kind of knock those two pieces out and just move forward from there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, adjacently, we've had, I think, out of a, roughly 166 feedback for Kennedy, we actually had 160 in favor of keeping the name. So that we had a, that survey worked fairly well. I think 166 is a pretty good um, return rate for something like that, and um, and having that overwhelming support. So hopefully we can get a similar level of return to kind of have some efficacy um, for the results that we're seeing for this process as well. 
And I'll reach out back out to Mr. Uh, Juan Buendia, that was his name. Yes, that's and who he was. was the mm -hmm. chairman of the Cells District, which is one of 11 political districts in the Tio Nation. So yeah. he um, is definitely somebody we can reach back out That to. would be epic. Thank you. Okay, will do. Thank you so yeah. much. Yes, any other questions, comments? All right, thank you guys so much for everything. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And thanks to these two. Thanks yes, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. And staying late. Yes. Sorry. I know I know you have to be at it again early in the morning. So we appreciate what you do. All right. And that brings us to our next agenda item, which is future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? The only thing I would suggest based on public comment tonight is maybe to consider having as an agenda item something that Robert approves to give as an update throughout the process of the lawsuit. Yeah. If that's a possibility just for public transparency. Yeah, we, we can absolutely explore that. Yeah. Okay. Any other future agenda items? Hearing none, we move on to our next, which is I move the governing board adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Buenas noches. Thank you. Drive safely.